minded myself. Uh, and we will have a Q&A with our guest speaker at the end of their presentation. Um, as I mentioned, the session is being recorded and we will have the recording of the session up on the on our website probably next week. So please feel free to uh, revisit the recording, share the recording uh, with your networks and your friends and check out our remaining two critical conversations for this semester. All right, so as we get started, I'm just going to introduce our speaker. Uh, all right, there we go. Marna Clowney Robinson is an access and information services librarian at the University of Michigan, where they work closely with librarians to help with the selection of materials for multicultural studies and social work areas. They earned an MSW with concentrations in mental health and interpersonal practice from the University of Michigan. Also earned their MLIS from Wayne State University, the School of Library and Information Science. Marna has also completed a fellowship at Simmons University in their Interprofessional Informationist Certificate Program and recently completed certification in the integrated, or excuse me, in integrated health through the University of Michigan's School of Social Work. And on a personal note, I had the pleasure of being on a panel with Marna over the summer for ALA's Social Responsibility Roundtable um, and was just really intrigued and just it was just wonderful to hear uh what they were saying so i think i was in marna's inbox like the next week saying can you please come uh and talk to class uh in the semester and so very grateful uh to have marna Clowney robinson here with us today so i'm going to turn it over to our guest speaker now and again uh we will be keeping track of your questions and answer or excuse me your questions in the chat box for our q a uh, at the end of the session. So again, welcome and so glad you're here today. Thank you so much, Dr. Cook. I really appreciate the invitation to come and speak um, with your class as well as with other professionals in the field today. I'm extremely excited to talk about um, trauma-informed librarianship and bibliotherapy, which are two of the areas that are so close to my heart and that I use um, quite often. So I am going to try and share my screen so that I can, all right, I'm hoping everybody can see the screen, yes, okay. Um, so, uh, so today's agenda, what we are going to kind of dig into just a little bit. Um, and I know that we don't have all day, but I could talk about this all day, and I, but I won't keep you. Um, but a little bit about who I am and what I do, as well as what we know about trauma, what we know about bibliotherapy, uh, and then some information about library uh, informed practices and where libraries fit in with that intersectionality between that and bibliotherapy. Um, so a little bit about myself, as Dr. Cook shared in my introduction, thank you again, Dr. Cook. Um, I am a librarian at the University of Michigan where I've been um, there for quite a while. Uh, in my current role, I am an access and information services librarian. Um, I am also a licensed clinical social worker uh, where I am in private practice as well as with the social service agency. And within that role, I specialize working with um, marginalized communities um, within the realms of identity issues, as well as eating disorders, among other issues. Um, <clears throat> so a little background about um, trauma-informed librarianship. One of the ways I fell into this was during um, my educational careers as within the School of Social Work at the University of Michigan, as well as within um, library science at Wayne State. And I wanted to combine the two because I saw a need working with people, because I love working with people. Um, and then I started to do trauma work uh, as an intern um, in my field placement uh, through the School of Social Work. And I started to see and hear things about conversations that were happening then, and they are starting to happen again now, where we are looking at trauma-informed practices 
within libraries as well as other organizations, but specifically since a lot of the issues have come up with the pandemic, social unrest, economic unrest, you name it, trauma-informed practices are starting to be talked about. Um, there are issues that we are seeing today that reflect directly towards libraries because libraries have always been a space where from my perspective a safe place for people to come and use resources to do research to do community outreach to to work with other populations and so a lot of libraries are starting to look at trauma-informed practices for their staff for their users and for the community uh, under the framework of trauma-informed approaches, organizations are trying and starting to examine how they provide their services to users because people are coming into our spaces, bringing with them some of the issues that they've had to deal with outside of our spaces. And I went the wrong way. I do, oh, there we go. Um, and so trauma, if we look at it, is detrimental to mental boundaries, regardless of age, gender, socioeconomic status. Um, and we see a lot of different types of trauma. Substance use, and, and it goes across the gamut. It doesn't affect one population more than the other. We see it in all populations. I see it as a therapist and I see it um, just as a human. Um, traumatic events challenge our public institutions as well as the service systems that we have in, in our spaces. How we interact with people, how we get information to them. We're seeing it when we work with them, work with people who come to our, our like I say, our circulation desk and they ask for books. Sometimes there's pressure on them to try and get a paper done and then they take it out on if they are coming to us with issues, such as we don't know if people come to us with a background of trauma. And so that's what a trauma-informed approach does. It understands that people may have their own issues coming into our spaces, okay? Um, there are institutions and service systems that are designed to provide individuals with support and services, and sometimes they can be traumatizing. And I say that thinking about, as we start to think about these things, we have to look at what our policies are doing. Um, there are a lot of um, policies that libraries, organizations, and other institutions have that may be traumatizing to people. Now, and when I say trauma, I know we had a meeting of, at four and I forgot, I better sign into oh, it now. <laughs> okay. Oh, I can hear somebody yeah, yeah. else. Um, Marna, hold on a minute. You are currently muted. <laughs> how did I get muted? Uh, someone okay. else I heard. Okay, you're, there we go. I am good. so sorry. I don't know how that happened. No um, worries. Okay. What is trauma? Trauma is a word that when we hear it, we often think of someone who has been through a traumatic event, such as being attacked being in a war, being, you know, have car accident, those are all forms of trauma. But there's, there's emotional and there's physical trauma, okay? Um, so the background of what we know about trauma is the American Psychiatric Association played a big role in defining what trauma was. And one of the things that I use um, in my practice every day, and we call it our therapist Bible, it's called the DSM-5, or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And basically, it lines up what trauma is. And there's different forms of trauma. Um, there are different categories of trauma. And the DSM-5 includes, there's a new category in there that addresses trauma and stressor-related disorders. So there's different types of trauma. We have acute trauma, which is, let's say you're in a car accident and that's the only single trauma that you may have, a, that is a stressful event to you. So it's acute. Then you have chronic trauma, which is repeated and prolonged exposure to stressful events. Examples of this are 
child abuse, bullying, domestic violence. Then we move into complex trauma, which is a result of multiple traumatic events that have occurred in this person's lifetime. And there's also historical trauma, which is the collective and emotional trauma uh, and psychological injury across lifespan and across generations. And we also have secondary or vicarious trauma. And that is a trauma that people who are in roles like mine as a therapist, we hear about trauma on a daily basis sometimes or a weekly basis or a monthly basis, depending on how many times we see people sometimes we will experience the trauma that we are trying to help people through. Um, one of the things that we have seen, um, researchers have seen with trauma is, particularly if we look at historical trauma, um, what we do and what I do as a therapist, whenever I work with someone, I, I go with what we call ACEs, which is a score from a, 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 an assessment that tells us how much trauma someone is exposed to. And there's trauma across the lifespan. Did you have two parents growing up in the household? Was there domestic violence in the household? And these are all based on when you're a kid and as you grow up. And what we know about trauma is um, that trauma is handed down generation after generation as generation. And scientists have actually looked at um, how trauma is transferred according to our genetics. And there is a lot of um, research that has pointed to particularly historical trauma as a residual of slavery being handed down generation after generation after generation. So that's a lot of trauma. So these are some of the different types of trauma that people may be walking around with. Now, some people may have never had trauma or admitted that they've had trauma, but we're seeing a lot of trauma coming through, not just our doors, but within our communities. Uh, let's see. Okay, um, so basically, Trauma occurs when a person is physically or emotionally harmed or faces a life-threatening event. Um, sometimes it's following a series of events that adversely affects their mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being for a long time. Trauma-informed programs understand the widespread impact of trauma and a potential to path to recovery. It recognizes the signs and symptoms of trauma and those of the individuals and their families and incorporate trauma knowledge into their policies, procedures, as well as resisting re-traumatization. And I'll mention a little bit more about resisting re-traumatization uh, according to SAMHSA, which is um, an organization that has come up with a really cool toolkit on how organizations can um, become more trauma-informed. So SAMHSA, um, which is the, uh, an organization that deals with mental health um, and substance abuse, um, basically what they have done is they've come out with a really great trauma-informed approach to dealing with trauma and how service organizations and, and communities can address some of the trauma that they're seeing in their spaces. Uh, so they're, they've come up with different um, tools that are really good assessments that organizations can look at to say, are we operating from a trauma-informed uh, approach? Meaning, not looking at someone and saying, what's wrong with you? But coming in and saying, what can we do? What happened to you? Okay. Um, so. Part of what SAMHSA has done was they created what um, they have termed the four R's, which is realizing the widespread impact of trauma, and it understands there are paths to recovery. Recognize 
which basically recognizing the signs and symptoms of trauma in clients, um, families, staff, and others involved within that system. Respond, basically responding to integrating knowledge about trauma into its policies, procedures, and practices, and seeking to resist re-traumatizing. For example, um, there have been a lot of discussions um, that <clears throat> libraries have started having about police within their, their buildings and organizations. Um, and one of the things that SAMHSA is starting to work, in, work on is looking at how inviting police into our spaces may be re-traumatizing people, especially within communities of color. Um, the trauma-informed approach can be implemented in pretty much any type of service setting or organization. And it is distinct from trauma-specific in interventions and treatments that are designed specifically to address the consequences of trauma and facilitate healing. A lot of what SAMHSA has done is they work with mental health agencies, and now they are starting to branch out into organizations because they are seeing a trend of trauma-informed processes being worked on. And so they want to be able to help um, with uh, facilitating healing. There are six key principles um, that SAMHSA has come up with for um, trauma-informed informed approaches. Um, and so they've kind of mapped it out for us, which is really good. And some of the, 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 the processes that they've mapped out or the principles is safety, ensuring that organizations are safe for people to come in, meaning the policies, the procedures that people encounter coming into our spaces are safe. They feel safe in, as well as staff working within those organizations, being trustworthy and transparent, meaning putting it out there what you mean, having peer support, collaborative collaboration and mutuality, empowerment, voice and choice and cultural, historical and gender issues, addressing all six of these. And one of the things that I found, which is a really cool graphic, and this is from an organization called Trauma Informed, uh, or Trauma Transformed, I'm sorry. Uh, it's a great organization. They have a lot of toolkits out there that you can download and you can use, and they give you a really good array of assessments that you can look at your own organization. And so what they did was they created coming from inducing trauma to reducing trauma. So, and what they've done is they've mapped it out so that as organizations become trauma organized, they become trauma informed to a more healing organization. Um, and they basically have been doing this for a while and they work primarily within communities working with youth. And it's a, it's a great way of seeing how an organization can become organized to lead to a healing organization. And on their website, and I've included um, a link at the end of the slide, so you should be able to get there and you can see these links, but they've mapped it out really well. Um, so then we move into bibliotherapy. And this is where I could talk to you for years, but I will resist. But bibliotherapy is something that I fell into. Um, it is a practice that not very many therapists use a lot uh, because they don't really know it exists. But as a librarian and I read lots of books, I kind of got drawn to it because I love books and I think books are very um, healing for people. Um, and this was a quote that I took from, um, I got permission from um, someone to use this and they were just talking about the journey that they were on with working through some of their issues using books. Um, so some of the background of bibliotherapy, it is a concept that tells you exactly what it is. It's using books in a therapeutic setting, period. 
That's all it is. Um, it was originally termed as what they called literary healing. And it was developed during World War I. And there were doctors, nurses, and librarians who came up with using books, working with soldiers who were battling the war in World War I. Um, Samuel Crothers, who was an author and a minister, he changed the name to bibliotherapy because he said, we're using books and we're doing therapy. Then Sadie Peterson Delaney, uh, who was a chief librarian of the VA in Tuskegee, Alabama, who basically started doing more research and using bibliotherapy with uh, soldiers who came in through the VA for treatment. She actually started training doctors and nurses to use books to promote healing, not just mental healing, but physical healing. So there's different types of bibliotherapy. There is developmental bibliotherapy, which is used um, to help children or adults um, address common life issues within a community or educational setting. And I've done some developmental bibliotherapy before working with um, uh, groups, usually parents and children, um, young adults mostly um, within um, my community. And it is a very, it's a good type of bibliotherapy, I will say. It's not my favorite. I like one-on-one, -on -one, but this works because what, what happens is the families get together, they share a book, they talk about it. Sometimes they will throw the book at the other person, depending on what we're talking about. So, but uh, it's a great tool. What I do is clinical therapeutic bibliotherapy, which basically involves using books in therapy to treat emotional disorders, alleviate negative life effects of an emotional, mental, or physical disorder. And it's often used in conjunction with other psychological treatment and sometimes medical treatments. Um, and I use uh, clinical bibliotherapy the most, and I love it. Um, and it is a way of just taking a book and choosing the right book for that client, for that individual. Um, and I, I always will tell people when they ask me, how do you choose the book for the person? And I don't know if anybody is a Harry Potter fan like I am, but there's a scene in Harry Potter where, um, Harry is picking his wand for the first time. And the, the man behind the counter, the shopkeeper says, the wand picks the wizard. And I, I kind of feel like the guy behind the counter when I find a book for, for someone I'm working with to work through some of those issues. Um, so how does it work? So basically I choose a book and I use some of the, the tools that I've learned as a librarian to choose the right book based on what someone is coming in to my office to deal with. Uh, and I work with everything. I've, I've worked with um, suicidal ideation. I've worked with um, eating disorders, identity issues, um, substance abuse, so forth and so on. Um, and so what I do is I find a book, I present the book to the client and I say, okay, I want you to read this. And I give them a journal too. I give them a, a composition notebook. And I'll say, then there's questions. So each book that I hand out to a client to work with, I read and I take notes and I come up with questions that I want them to answer. And so once you give them the book, the first step in a therapeutic process is they identify with the character in the book. One of the books that I've used is a book called... Um, Lighter Than My Shadow, which is a book about eating disorders. And the client will connect with this person in the book. And this one's a specific book that I choose with people who are dealing with trauma as well as an eating disorder. Um, because the backstory, the foundation of why that eating disorder began for the person in the book has to do with the trauma that they were going through. Um, the second step is catharsis or a stage. And that is where the reader 
experiences the character's emotions and struggles. And through that process, they're able to connect with their own and we talk through it. We'll say, okay, the character went through that. What are you feeling? They start to talk to me more. Uh, they develop some insight where the, the reader recognizes similarities between the characters and the situation in that particular book or passage. And we talk through it. And then we get to the final stage, which is universalization, which some people say yes, some people say no, depending on the bibliotherapy world. Um, but basically, the patient, the client sitting in my office realizes that they're not alone. That someone else has gone through what they are going through, and they're able to start to find solutions for themselves. It is a very therapeutic and powerful process, sitting in a space with someone and using a book, a book that gets them to get to that emotion and talk through that emotion, particularly, and I deal a lot with people with trauma to deal with that trauma. One of the books that I used um, this summer was a book called uh, Ghost Boys, which was a wonderful book that um, I use with a lot of um, African-American men, young men who were struggling with what was going on with George Floyd. And they were able to make that connection. And it was a very powerful um, tool to help them move from where they came in struggling to where they are discharged and can lead and move on with their life. Okay, so how does trauma-informed librarianship and bibliotherapy kind of connect? Um, so why trauma-informed? Trauma-informed allows us to recognize, and when I say us, most of us are I'm probably all librarians or studying to be librarians, recognize that every decision we make, every interaction we have, and every policy we create can be re-traumatizing or healing for patients or for ourselves. Meaning, there are policies that sometimes libraries have, sometimes organizations have, that can cause people to re-traumatize based on what they come in with. Now, I'm not saying policies are bad because we need policies, we need rules, we need law, we need all of those things, but it's, and, and I'll go back with the, um, the example I gave earlier about policing in our libraries. That, that policy that we have could be re-traumatizing to someone who has dealt with police before. And it's how we interact with people. Um, librarians can help by having policies that support the four R's, which is realization, recognition, recognizing, responding, and resisting re-traumatization. It's reviewing our policies and understanding that some of those policies need to be changed because sometimes the policies haven't been changed for 20, 30 years. Bibliotherapy in libraries. Bibliotherapy is a very powerful tool. It can help people kind of connect and understand with their community. I have done community talks, not at my library, but in public libraries or in public spaces, where we've taken some of these books that I've included here, and we've had discussions about them. It connects the community through a book, okay? Um, librarians can connect with community groups, can connect with student groups, can connect with all kinds of programs around the book. It helps start the conversation. And that's where bibliotherapy can be beneficial to libraries. Um, not everybody is going to be a therapist and not everybody wants to be a therapist. Um, and I'm not saying go into your libraries and do therapy because you've got to be licensed to do that. But what I'm saying is using books to start conversations with communities, with groups is a powerful thing. Um, it is something that, like I said, I have learned to kind of craft more and build a really good therapeutic tool 
that I use not just with um, individuals, but with community groups when I work with them. Um, people will ask me, oh, well, how does, um, how does uh, bibliotherapy work with, you know, old people, young people, so forth? All populations respond differently. I don't do it with, I'd say 13 to 15 year olds because they don't like to read, okay? The ones that I work with. There are a lot that do like to read, but they don't like to read in therapy because they do a lot of that in their homework and you know school assignments, so they won't read, but they love doing poetry. Poetry is a form of bibliotherapy. It is something that um, libraries can branch out and do. Uh, at our library, we do this really cool thing called Cafe Shapiro, where undergrads will, will share their stories and write poetry, and it's very powerful to them. And I'm finding that that is true within the realm of the work that I do as a therapist. Um, some of the some of the the site the sources that I use, and I've included a lot of the links here. But I want to make sure that we have enough time for questions. Um, and um, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is cracking a little bit. But um, yeah, I'm 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 open for questions. I know that was a little quick. I went faster than I thought. So. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you so much. We do have some questions and please feel free to add additional questions uh, in the chat box. So I'll start with a question. Um, what are, what are your thoughts about the relationship between bibliotherapy and reader's advisory? Because I know uh, some folks in the chat have said they've never heard of bibliotherapy, um, mm -hmm. but I'm sure a lot of people are perhaps more familiar with Reader's Advisory? It is a similar process, but the only difference is that bibliotherapy was and can be a tool within a therapeutic realm, okay? Now, granted, you can do it within a community, but, and a lot of people have said that. They said, well, what is bibliotherapy? I've never done that before. And I, and I push back and say, you probably have, it just wasn't called that. But they're very similar. They, get, they do the same thing, but with bibliotherapy specifically in a therapeutic or clinical setting, it moves a person from point A to point B. We start where they are and we move them through the process where they can find healing for whatever they're struggling with. For example, um, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to pull up an example of something that one of my, um, that I use within, um, where's the share button? Can you guys see this on the screen or no? Yes, we can see okay. it. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is a book that I used um, in, uh, over the summer called I Am Alfonso Jones. And I've been doing a lot with graphic, what we call graphic medicine or graphic novels, but I, I call it graphic medicine. And <clears throat> I started branching out more into using graphic medicine with younger people and with some, um, um, I'd say between the ages of 20 and 27 because they read really fast, okay? And I use this book and I worked with a 13 year old who was struggling with what was going on because it was the height of the pandemic and then George Floyd happened and they wouldn't talk to me. And I sat in a room and I said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna change it up a little bit. I'm gonna give you a book and I want you to read it and then we're gonna talk about it. And this young man took this book home and came back and I gave him a panel and this is, it's six panels on a page here. He, threw, he drew three. This is how he felt. These are bars because he said, this is what he thought his future was. And this is where he was having nightmares about, okay? We were able to talk through this and move him through this process where he wasn't feeling alone. He was talking to his parents. He was doing things within the community. But to have a 13 year old sit in your space and just, and number one, angry is all get out, okay? He was angry and I get a lot of anger from young, from young people. Sometimes I get kicked and I don't like it. But anyway, yeah, they kick. Um, but 
but he was extremely angry and his parents were like, he has, he has behavior issues. We don't know what's going on. They didn't know he was dealing with this, but having him read this book, he came back and he was just, and he just, I couldn't get him to stop talking, but he was able to open up and tell me what he was feeling. And sometimes with the 13 year old, and I see it a lot, especially with um, young men, not all, but some, they have all of these emotions where they just can't tell you what they're feeling. But giving him this piece of paper, and he drew this in, in my office in one setting. And to give him a piece of paper and draw, he can draw and tell me what he's feeling about. And then we talk about it. And I say, okay, tell me why you drew this. Tell me why you drew that. And his parents had no idea that he was seeing these images in the news and in media and hearing his friends talk about it, that he actually internalized it and just kind of got angry about it. So it's a very, it's a very therapeutic process that um, um, it's, it is, um, for me, it is one of the biggest tools that I use in a therapeutic process with someone. Thank you. That's really powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned, um, now I'm going to start the questions from our audience. And okay. uh, you had mentioned uh, at the top of your talk that you kind of just fell into bibliotherapy and someone wanted to know uh, if you could talk a little bit more about how you got into it, how uh, you developed um, your expertise in the area. Sure, sure. Um, I was doing some research when I was in library school and they give you these assignments where they say, okay, find someone that you, you know, want to connect with. And I discovered the, um, the librarian who was doing the work in bibliotherapy at the VA and it intrigued me. And I just thought, okay, I'm going to be a librarian and I'm going to um, be a therapist at some point in my life. And I don't know what I'm going to do. And when I was in my field placement in, in, in social work, when you're doing clinical social work, what you have to do is before you graduate, you have to do what they call your clinical hours, which they place you in an organization and you actually just do therapy. Or you do, depending on if you are macro or micro, individual or group. And I chose the, the individual level. And um, I had a young man, um, who was assigned to me and I didn't, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I, they were just like, go therapy, therapy, do and come back to, and so I started remembering some of the things that I was reading as a grad student um, when I was finishing up my MLIS. And I learned that this librarian took these books and gave them to soldiers who are struggling with substance abuse, struggling with PTSD, struggling with other issues, and reading her research and reading the research into bibliotherapy, I was like, I could probably try and do some of that with this young person. And I started picking up books and I gave this young person a book. And I can't remember the title because it's been so long. Um, and he, we started talking about this book in, in session. And so from there, I, I saw the change in him. And what I did was I signed up. There's an organ there. You really don't have to be certified as a bibliotherapist. It's helpful if you have a therapy degree. Yes. And it's helpful if you have a library background. Yes, because you have to choose the books. And what I did was I signed up with this organization. It's out of England where you can learn how to choose books for different mental health and physical health issues. And so from there, I started um, just reading, reading, reading. And I stumbled upon this database that Central Michigan University used to have. And it was the only one in existence. I. I've not found another that has recreated a database, but what they did was they created a database. It's now defunct, so it's gone. 
where they would go in and they had volunteers come in and they would write summaries of books used for bibliotherapy. It was a research project that grad students started and they kept it up for a good long time and then it kind of disappeared. Um, and so basically I pretty much sought out um, the experts who were able to teach me how to do what I needed to do. And a lot of people who go through this organization, like I say, it's out of England, um, are librarians, are librarians who become therapists. And so from there, I just kind of just started doing it and just kind of fell into it almost. Um, but it was a process that I had to actually figure out the steps to becoming an expert in this area. Now I'm not a hundred percent expert. There's other people who probably do it better than I do, but I've been doing it for four years and I have seen results. I have seen um, books used in therapy, used by people who read them, who are able to talk through what they're struggling with and help themselves move from point A to point Z. Absolutely, thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to um, combine two of the questions and you know, and it relates to what you were saying um, about your, your process and you know, particularly that database that's now defunct, which is really unfortunate. Um, if anyone needs like a dissertation project or a master's thesis, I would you know, get on that. Um, but the questions are, do you use fiction or nonfiction more often? And also, do you read the books first? I read every book every book. And I will give you a little hint. If you are planning on at some point becoming a therapist, at some point doing community readings <clears throat> where you use books, I highly recommend using young adult novels. Okay. They are very fast reads. They are filled with a lot of emotion and a lot of really rich characters. Now, not saying that other books don't do that because I use both. Um, but I use young adult fiction and graphic medicine in my practice all the time. Um, I use a combination of nonfiction and fiction, depending on what the person is coming in with. Um, there's a really great book, um, which is kind of similar to the database, but some of the books in there are questionable. Um, but it's a, it's a book called um, A to Z. Um, cures from A to Z. And it basically what someone has done is taken books and <clears throat> kind of mapped out according to mental health issues, which books match with which. And like I say, some of them are very questionable um, because I would never use some books for um, people who are struggling, let's say with suicidal ideation. Some of the books on this list would never, never use with the person because it would it would set, it would trigger them too much. Okay. Um, and that's why I read all the books before I even give it out to somebody. So I have been reading a lot of books. Um, the pandemic, uh, gave me a lot more time to read. So I've got this, as we say, central's databases down. I started compiling my own database. So I have my own database of books that I can search from and pull up and I have the, the, the guides that I created with the questions that I just print and hand to somebody with the book. Um, but young adult novels are great. Um, George, I just finished reading George, um, which is a great book. And I started working with um, some young people on that one. Um, what's another good one? Um, oh, I've got tons, I got, I got tons. Um, but young adult books are amazingly good for that process. Because like I said, it's very quick and I can give it to somebody and they can have it um, completed in a couple sessions. Whereas if you give somebody a big novel, sometimes it's too heavy and too much. So, um, but yes, young adult novels, um, I use a combination of fiction and nonfiction, um, either works, but I, uh, I recommend that 
before handing a book to somebody, you know what the content is. And that's the, that's the process that I do. You have to know what the content is of that book and if it's going to work with that particular person. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, another question is uh, you, when you were talking about um, I am Alonzo Jones, do the parents or caregivers also read the books or is it just for the person that you're working with directly? Usually I bring in, depending on the age, okay, now I am Alonzo Jones is a, it's a book that has a lot of, you know, imagery that could be upsetting to the person. And I always get the, I always get the sign off on the parent before I do it. Okay. Now, if they're 17 or older, it's, they, I really don't need to, um, you know, sign, have the parent sign off on it. But usually if they're younger, I always involve the parent because if the parent and, uh, is aware, they're going to have that conversation with their kid. Um, and that's the, that's the process I want to see continuing to move forward. Um, most parents are, you know, they're a little skeptical. They're like, but it's a book. You're just giving the kid a book. They read so much in school. I'm like, they're not reading enough. Um, and then, so the parent will read it and then the parent will want to come in and have sessions too. And sometimes I have done family sessions using bibliotherapy. I really have. And it is, um, like I said, doing groups, um, bibliotherapy is for me, not my favorite, because like I say, um, the last time I did a session with bibliotherapy and a family, it was a family that was kind of dysfunctional and falling apart. And um, let's just say books got thrown here and there in session. And sometimes I have to throw people out of my office um, because you're not, I have rules that they have to follow. But um, but I have, I've brought families in, especially when I'm working with young people to have that conversation, to open that conversation up and they're able to continue that conversation at home, which is great. Absolutely, thank you. So let's see. So folks are asking about recommended resources where they can learn more about bibliotherapy and mm -hmm. there's a specific, uh, another specific question, if you could uh, give, provide the name of the UK organization. I can, and I, as I look it up, I will talk through it. Um, I'm just trying to think, mm -hmm. trying to find it. It's on my, it's on my desktop somewhere. Let me, let me stop sharing. There we go, that's better. Um, the organization in the UK is called, I'm sorry, Dr. Cook, what was the second part of that question? And just resources in general, uh, okay. where people can learn more. Yeah, there is a great book um, called Bibliotherapy. Um, it is a wonderful book. Um, the American Library Association also has a page on bibliotherapy, which gives you links to um, educational projects, children's literature, and the, the foundation is called the International Federation for Biblio slash Poetry Therapy. That's the, that's the UK organization. Um, and basically it is, um, like I say, it's a really interesting organization because when you sign up, they send you this, this link and I'm gonna share my screen so I can show you guys what I'm talking about. Um, so here it is, the International Federation for Biblio slash Poetry Therapy. And basically they say you can get credentialed as a poetry therapist or poetry facilitator. And basically you just sign up, they send you this um, like a two page uh, kind of an assessment and then you can start the process. Then they send you a syllabus of like things that you have to read, things that you have to do, kind of like you're taking the class and anyone can sign up. Um, sometimes you can find that they'll say, well, are you a librarian or are you a therapist? Anyone can do it. Um, and it's actually a really good thing. What happens is after you go through their program, then they, they connect you with a professional who does bibliotherapy. 
and it's kind of like you're shadowing them and you're actually doing some of the um some of the stuff that you need to do as a bibliotherapist um <clears throat> and the ala website is here which they provide with a lot of other resources on bibliotherapy which is really good so um but yeah this is the uh, organization that i um signed up for and started uh i think the the packet they send you costs like 20 bucks and you get a pdf of it which is it's just a syllabus with all of the stuff that you need so which is pretty good so perfect and um louisa was kind enough to pop those links into the chat and so we'll post those links uh, along with today's recording so you can refer back to that so the next question is i and i think you've addressed a little bit of this uh, in your, your conversation thus far, but the question is that I imagine that just as choosing the right book can be healing, the wrong book could be re-traumatizing. Mm -hmm. Do you have advice for people who aren't trained in social work on how to recommend books that are supportive to a particular reader? And on the flip side, what are pitfalls to avoid? It depends on what you're recommending the book for, okay? Um, and that, and I, and I say that come as a therapist, okay, because you are exactly right. Turning and handing a book saying, okay, this is, this is what you need. And you don't know the content. You don't know if it's going to be triggering and you don't know what they're exactly dealing with can be very dangerous to that person, which is why I read all of the books and I have, um, <clears throat> looked within an area to make sure it is something that is safe to use with the client, with the person that I'm working with. Um, some of the pitfalls in, if you have somebody who is struggling with, with any type of issue, they need to be seeing a professional, period. And it, that's, that's the bottom line. Because even as a therapist, there are some disorders that I will not work with because I'm not qualified to, I'm not certified or qualified and I haven't worked with them. I haven't had the the additional training to work with certain issues. And I'll give an example. Um, in as a social worker, we're we're constantly being asked by other therapists, hey, how would you work with this person? How would you work with that person? Um, and I had someone ask me once, they they had a, a client with um, what they suspected was an eating disorder. And the first thing I said was, you need to get them to an eating disorder specialist. They were like, well, why? I'm a therapist. I said, but have you worked with eating disorders before? And they said, well, no. I said, well, what's the first thing you're going to do when you have this person in your office? Well, I don't know. I'm just going to ask them what they eat. I said, you're, you're going to set them up to fail. And they need to see an eating disorder specialist because with eating disorders, it's a complex treatment process that you have to go through. I am, I am a specialist in that area because I've gone through all of the training that I needed to go through to become that type of therapist. Um, and it's the same thing with books. If you have someone who is struggling, always direct them to the resources that they need. It's just like, you know, trauma-informed practices within, let's say libraries, because we're all librarians. You are not going to do therapy with somebody coming into your spaces. You're going to refer them to resources that's going to help them. You can be a trauma-informed organization, but you can't provide therapy unless you have the tools to be able to do that. And it's the same thing with bibliotherapy. It's like you can some of the books that I saw in that list, A, the A to Z Cure, um, I would never recommend. Um, one of the books was by, uh, oh, what was it? Uh, Rand, Anne Rand. I would never recommend that book to somebody who was depressed, okay? It is not a book that someone with, with, with major depressive disorder should be reading because it's very triggering and it's going to send them down a deeper hole, okay? Um, most people love books because like i said they're very they're very enjoyable they take us to places where we may have never been before okay they take us to other worlds that 
probably really don't exist except for on the pages of a book. Books are very powerful tools that using bibliotherapy can work, but you got to have the tools and you got to have the expertise to be able to do it right. It's just like, I'm not going to tell people I'm a brain surgeon. It's not going to work because I've never done it. Um, and that, that's the biggest pitfall is I have worked with a lot of people that said, well, such and such told me to read this book and I read it and now I'm worse than I was before. And I said, well, your first problem is you read the book. They meant well, but that's not the book for you. So um, that's, that's the biggest is understanding where our limitations are. Sometimes we just, the, the thing to do to help people is just point them in the right direction for resources. That's it. Absolutely. So we have time for uh, one last question. And uh, someone wants to know if you are aware of whole person librarianship, which is a social work approach to library service and what your thoughts are about perhaps the differences uh, between the, the two approaches or similarities, uh, differences, et cetera. I am very familiar with whole person and I, I am <clears throat> a, a, a supporter of the whole person um, approach. I was actually interviewed for the book that um, the two authors um, came out with not too long ago. Um, it is a process that looks at not just one subset, but looking at the whole person of how all the systems work together. And I'll give you a really good example. When I was uh, a, uh, a grad student, I was at Michigan State. I know I said Michigan State. Um, <laughs> um, I was in working uh, as an intern in their residence halls. What Michigan State has done with their residence hall is they've taken this whole person approach where everyone from the cleaning staff to the cooking staff to the advisors, they have all been trained on how to recognize when a student's in trouble and how to get that student through the system so that they are a success. And that was their goal. And it's a very, I mean, it's a very complex system that they have developed there. Um, I'm not sure where it's at today because I haven't, I mean, it's been years since I've been um, an intern, but it's kind of similar to the whole person approach is understanding that people are complex and they come to us, they're different. People have different foundations that we all grew up with. We were all um, set on our path to adulthood, but based on different foundations. And the whole person approach um, that I am just so excited about is it looks at, it includes a trauma-informed approach. And it understands that people come into our spaces with their own things. We come in to work in our spaces with our own things. And it's understanding that, let's say, and I'm at an academic institution, we have this undergrad who comes in, let's say they start and they're brand new. We have to understand that just because we hand them a book, they may not understand how to use the book. They may not ha understand how to use the research. They may have trauma that they're working. So it's looking at the whole person, not just a part of the person. And I, I love the concept. And um, it is, as I say, it's the second half of my career that I'm starting to kind of dig a little bit deeper into because, it's, because it is a process. And I think medicine has, um, in some sense, kind of gone in this way where it is becoming more integrative, which right now you may be able to go into your doctor's office and they're gonna start asking you, okay, what are your mental health concerns? I had a doctor ask me the other day, what do you do for fun? Well, that's why I ask people who come into my office with mental health concern. What do you do for fun? Because you can use that as a stress reliever, okay? And that's where that whole person approach, I love that, I love the concept, I love, um, uh, working with the authors, I'm actually, I, we have a, a group, Google group that we kind of communicate with and we share ideas on how to make this approach a much bigger perspective within libraries right now, but it's a great, I love, I love the concept. 
All right. Thank you so much. This has been really enlightening, really informative. And I know that you've given folks a lot to think about. You're getting uh, lots of praise and thanks and gratitude in the chat box. Um, and thanks yeah. to everyone for the great questions. All right. So we are at time. So we're going to close uh, on this note. And thank you so much, Marna. This has been absolutely amazing. And thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise with us today. I thank you and I thank everybody for um, coming out and I thank you, Dr. Cook, for inviting me. This was this was great. Like I said, I could talk about this all day. Well, so. listen, there, there will be other opportunities. Don't worry. Okay. All right. <laughs> all right. Thank you all so much. As I put in the chat box, um, our series homepage, we have two more lectures, one on November 18th and one on December 2nd for our critical conversations in LIS. And as always, you are uh, welcome to join us and join in on the conversation. So everyone enjoy the rest of your day and we hope to see you at another lecture. Marna, thanks so much.